Hey fellow AP nerds, have you talked about inflammation yet today? If you haven't, I suggest we do it right now. So this is a little lecture specifically designed for the second semester students regarding immunity and the process we call inflammation. I made this little lecture because oftentimes the diagrams or figures you might have in a textbook don't explain it very well or sometimes they just make the assumption that you know a lot of things that maybe you haven't heard of before. So I like to call this little lecture, Suppose Somebody Hits You With a Stick. And before we get to the stick hitting part, let's understand that we're talking about inflammation, which is part of nonspecific immunity. I always prefer to describe this process as being in the ballpark of nonspecific immunity rather than innate immunity. Innate implies it's something you're born with, but you are born with all the types of immunity you have. So I like to say nonspecific rather than innate. And one thing to understand about inflammation or the inflammatory process is that it may or may not involve pathogens. It does not have to have a bacterium in it or a virus in it or some other sort of pathogenic thing or microorganism not necessary for inflammation to happen. You'll see what I mean in a minute. What it does involve is damage to a tissue. It will involve mast cells, the damaged tissue cells. It will involve neutrophils and macrophages often along with other immune cells, and a whole bunch of proteins. Something to remember to keep in mind when we are talking about immunity, it's really all about cells and proteins. What proteins do cells respond to? What proteins do these cells make? What's the job of these proteins? So think about that as you begin your study of immunity. It's all about cells and proteins. I always tell my students it's a good, good idea to maybe construct yourself a table of immunity cells. The name of the cell, what protein does it make? Name of the cell, what protein does it make? And then maybe even another column, what's the job or function of this protein once it's made? So think about that as you study for a lecture, but let's get down to it, the nitty gritty on inflammation. What you see here is a not too artfully crafted picture of a basic human tissue. I don't really care what the tissue is. It doesn't matter too much. It could be just about anything. So what I have done here is drawn what could loosely be described as a connective tissue here with a capillary in it, a mast cell, and some of the tissue cells. Yes, second semester students, I picked what appears to be cuboidal epithelium, but it could be just about any cells, it doesn't really matter. So this is just your garden variety tissue that we have here. And this is the stuff that gets hit with a stick. Here comes the stick. So, bang, 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 this tissue just got struck with a stick. That's going to do something to this tissue. It may or may not open up the skin because wouldn't this tissue, everyone, have skin covering it that I just hit with my stick. And isn't it possible that I could get struck with some object, have a traumatic injury to this tissue right here that does not cause my skin to open? I don't bleed, no bacteria jump in. Couldn't I also have an injury that does involve opening the skin and bacteria enter? So I could have it either way. But in either scenario, 
I've still potentially damaged the tissue, there may or may not be pathogens present. It's important to keep that in mind. Our inflammatory response will behave as if pathogens are here, whether they are here or not. I'm going to say that again. The inflammatory response behaves in such a way to address an invasion of pathogens, whether pathogens are present here or not. So when I get struck with this stick, ouch, 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 I just got hit by a stick, that will irritate mast cells that may be embedded in this tissue and cause damage to the cells of this tissue, be they fibroblasts or muscle cells or whatever they are. This irritation of the cells in the tissue will start everything going. So let's first take a look at our mast cell over here. So a mast cell embedded in my tissue, in the connective tissue fibers in and or surrounding my tissue, is a lot like a basophil. They do, according to most, have a slightly different cell origin, but essentially what you're talking about here is a cell that behaves like a basophil. It's just not moving around in your bloodstream. It contains lots of little granules of histamine, just like a basophil does. You might remember that as your job of a basophil. So when the mast cell gets irritated, it spits out histamine. And what does histamine do? Histamine will increase vascular permeability. What does that mean in English? It's going to make your capillaries leak more. Now, I want you to understand, everybody, you probably already know this, all of our capillaries leak, right? That's why we have a lymphatic system. They all leak. So here is my capillary leaking in my tissue. When histamine comes in, that just makes more leaking from my capillaries. So it makes them leakier. How's that? The damaged tissue cells, they will release prostaglandins. You may have heard of these before, sort of lipid-ish localized hormones. And the prostaglandins released here when the tissue cells are damaged will increase histamine's effectiveness. Now, what I mean when I say that is, okay, histamine makes my blood vessels in this local area where the injury has happened leak more. I release prostaglandins, and now they get super leaky. So not only do I have leaky, extra leaky, now I have super leaky blood vessels in this particular area where the blow has occurred from the stick. Something else released by my damaged tissue cells. So this is all coming from my impact with this stick, everyone. Chemicals that will activate kininogen into the kinins. Kininogen, the last three letters, G-E-N, indicate this is an inactive protein. This is normally floating around in your blood and it gets activated when these damaged tissue cells, what they do is they actually release enzymes, get this everybody, called kininogenases. Yeah, yeah, I know, it's an enzyme. You've heard this sort of thing before. And they will activate kininogen into the kinins. The kinins are a group of proteins that will serve as a chemotaxis trail. A chemotaxis trail. For who? Neutrophils and macrophages, essentially phagocytic cells. 
Now, I want to pause here for just a minute so we can set the stage for what is to come. So my tissue has been hit by a stick. The mast cell, histamine. The damaged tissue cells, prostaglandins and chemicals, actually enzymes that will activate kinins. Kininogen, floating around in my plasma anyway, made by the liver, gets activated into kinins. So now I've got these chemicals, histamine, prostaglandins, and kinins, making my blood vessels super uber leaky and as the role of the kinins implies drawing in help phagocytic cells neutrophils and macrophages specifically the name here kinins tells me a little bit kin like kinetic energy like kinesiology the study of human body movements that some of you will go into more in the, the physical therapy and sports medicine arenas. Action proteins. These are proteins that will draw in phagocytic cells. So if I center my injury right here, so this is the site of my injury where I was hit with the stick, right, everybody? Why would I want to draw in neutrophils and macrophages to this place? Why would I want to do that? Because I might have pathogens here. There might be things that need to be phagocytized. So what will happen because of these kinins? So let's do this. So here are the kinins being let loose, kinins. And the kinins will draw in those two, we'll say essentially white blood cell populations, neutrophils. These are the weird, goofy nucleus, polymorphonuclear ones, right? You can see those in one of my lab videos. So a bunch of neutrophils. And some monocytes. I'll throw in a couple big monocytes. Monocytes, what I like to call the incredible hulk of immunity, because they just love to smash things, don't they? So here come some monocytes. These are my phagocytic cells. So monocytes. Their derivatives, macrophage cells, right? So they're being drawn here by <laughs> following this chemotaxis trail to where the kinins are being released. So these white blood cells are being drawn to this site because there might be something here for them to kill. So histamine makes my blood vessels leaky, extra leaky. That does allow the white blood cells to get out a little easier, but they are white blood cells. They could leave anyway. And I have a chemotaxis trail. This increase in vascular permeability that we see, so this leaking of my blood vessel. Let's go back to my picture. So the leaking of my blood vessel causes fluid to leak out all over in here right and that's what causes heat redness swelling and pain heat lots of metabolism going on here lots of cells moving around heat redness swelling and pain considered to be the four cardinal signs of inflammation this is what we call the cardinal signs of inflammation, heat, redness, swelling, and pain. Not cardinal because it reminds us of a bird or a priest, cardinal because one of them is redness, like the red cardinal. That's why the bird is called a cardinal is because it's red. So one of the signs here is redness. So heat, redness, swelling, and pain. 
the heat comes from the release of this fluid from my leaky capillaries. Redness, a little bit of hemoglobin's coming out too. Swelling, I've got more fluid leaking out than my lymphatic system can drain away quickly. And pain, histamine, and these kinins will actually also trigger my free nerve endings in the tissue, causing me some pain. Plus, because I have all this swelling, I'm putting physical pressure against some of my nervous receptors. This is where the pain comes from. So heat, redness, swelling, and pain, all in this area of my injury. The neutrophils and macrophages have shown up as my phagocytic cells. That's what they are. Remember, these are phagocytic cells. They are considered nonspecific immune cells. Why? Because they can attack and or destroy many different things that they recognize as non-self based on the chemicals that are on the surface of pathogens. Now, I know this is a lecture for a different time, and boy, we could talk forever about immunity. Here, I'm just trying to give you a somewhat brief explanation of inflammation. But the way neutrophils and macrophages recognize non-self cells is by chemicals on the surface of these things, even if it's not a cell like a virus. So they'll look for specific repeating, oftentimes sugar, lipid, or protein chemicals on the surface of these pathogens. And if they can recognize them as non-self, they will destroy them. So these are my soldiers coming to do battle. They've come to fight pathogens that might be there. Let's go back up to my wound. So the neutrophils and macrophages are showing up in case there's some bacteria here. So let me draw in just i'll pick a good color here how about blue will that work yeah so let me draw in a couple bacteria just as an example so the wound has breached my skin and some bacteria entered right through a cut i have so now there's somebody for these phagocytic cells to fight isn't there? There are some phagocytic cells here to fight these pathogens. So I want you to imagine this, this is a rumble. This is a battle that's going to happen here between team me over here, my cells, and team them, the bacteria. In this case, I just picked a bacterium as my pathogen. So what we have is a battle that's going to go on here and not a nice clean battle like you might think of. No, this is going to be down and dirty. This is going to be like the Battle of the Bastards in Game of Thrones. This is going to be like something from Lord of the Rings. This is going to be cells going at it, you know, quote unquote, hand to hand right here at my wound site. This is going to be a big knockdown drag out fight. So I want you to imagine one of these neutrophils. Maybe he's the leader. So he, he comes out in front of everybody. He goes back and forth in front of his troops, you know, giving them some sort of speech for the movie buffs, you know, something like for Leonidas and the 300. Maybe he cries that out. Maybe he says, we happy few, we band of brothers. Hold the line for Narnia. Not this day, this day we fight. Or maybe for the Braveheart fans, you know, these pathogens can do whatever they want, but they can't take a freedom. Something like that. Get all excited, fired up, because there's going to be a fight here. And these neutrophils and macrophages, which come out of my blood vessels, come from my tissues, they've been drawn here, and now they start fighting these bacteria 
and it's nasty. I mean, chemicals being spit out, bacteria being ripped open, lysed inside the macrophages. I mean, this is this is a big, big battle here. And in this big battle, you need to understand there are only three possible outcomes, aren't there? We could have a win, meaning your tissues win. We kill the bacteria, the macrophages, and neutrophils go home. Everything's done. Great. We won. We could lose, which means I can't kill the bacteria off, and they start multiplying more and more of them. This is dangerous, right? This is when I need some of you people, future medical professionals, to come and help me. So I could win. I could lose. What's the other alternative? It could be a draw. Win, lose, or draw. Now, obviously, we hope for this one. Win, lose, or draw. We hope for the win. The neutrophils, the macrophages, come to the wound site. They attack and destroy the bacteria and eliminate them. Then all we have to do is repair the tissue. That's the most favorable outcome for us. If we lose, we need medical assistance. Antibiotics. Cut me open, irrigate the wound, remove the bacteria, etc. A worse loss. The bacteria enter my blood, I get septic, and I die. Sorry to be so blunt. These are the losing scenarios, right, where I need you to help me. And sometimes we have a draw. Let's talk about that for a moment. Notice what I wrote right here. Two other proteins also leak out of my super leaky blood vessels. Fibrinogen and heparin also leak out of these super uber leaky blood vessels. Do you remember what fibrinogen is? Of course, this is one of my clotting proteins. This is the one that gets changed into fibrin to make an actual blood clot. Do you remember what heparin is? This is an anticoagulant, an anti-clotting protein to help stop that positive feedback mechanism that we know as clotting. Notice, everyone, I don't say this is a blood thinner. People in the medical world say that heparin doesn't actually make your blood thinner, but it does make it less likely to clot. This is why people call it that. If I wanted your blood to be thinner, I would have to reduce your number of red blood cells. How's that? Heparin doesn't do that. So heparin is an anticoagulant drug, commonly called a blood thinner. So let's go back up here. This plays into if we have a draw. What if I can't beat these bacteria down? What if these bacteria are putting up a good fight? Well, that'll cause more tissue damage, more histamine release, more prostaglandins, more chemicals that activate the kinins. My inflammation would get greater here, wouldn't it? And do you know what we do sometimes for some pathogens? We just wall them off. I'll start laying down fibrin around the wound site. We'll start forming fibrin around the battlefield. The heparin is released out here and it stops the growth of this fibrin mass that we have. And I've just made what's called a cyst. Oh, look at this. this is a giant mess, isn't it? And I have no idea where those lines came from. But 
this is a big old cyst. What's a cyst? A bunch of fibrin laid down around a potential wound site. And what's going to be inside this cyst? Oh, you've heard of it. Pus. Lovely words. Got to love that. What is pus that might show up in my cyst? Well, pus is that battlefield after the battle. So, you know, our forces have come in and they've fought the bacteria right here. And what's inside this cyst? Dead and dying pathogens. Dead and dying neutrophils. Cytoplasm streaming out. A lot of proteins laying around, interstitial fluid, all this stuff. This is what pus is. Pus is that battlefield after the battlefield. And in some instances, not always, we might be able to insist this battlefield so that the bacteria can't spread further. That's why we have to include heparin and fibrinogen being released from this leaky blood vessel. So we have three possible outcomes. When I win, everybody goes home, meaning my macrophages and neutrophils. I lose, I need medical assistance, or I possibly die. Maybe we have a draw. I insist the bacteria and just leave them inside that cyst until one of you people comes along and surgically drains it or something like that. These are the three most likely outcomes. In fact, they're the three only outcomes for inflammation. The histamine, the prostaglandins, and the kinins, these are what we typically refer to as the chemical mediators of inflammation. These are the chemical mediators of inflammation. Histamine, prostaglandins, kinins. If you think of this, maybe this would help. Only because I can sort of draw an arm. Here's somebody's arm. Forearm. I'm not even going to attempt to draw the hand. I can't draw a hand. But Let's say that I took a needle and I injected this person right here with histamine, prostaglandins, and kinins. You know what's going to happen? They're going to have inflammation, swelling right here because I just in injected them with the chemical mediators. What if I hit you with that stick right here on your shoulder? but no pathogens are present. You'd still have inflammation. There's just no battle, right? Everybody with me on that, I hope. So what we have up here in my overly messy picture is a description of inflammation if pathogens are present. If no pathogens are present, I could still have inflammation just because of the tissue damage. So Having pathogens at the inflammatory site is not a necessary thing. We get inflammation without pathogens all the time. You twist your ankle and have a sprain and it swells up. That comes from the tissue damage. So your body is responding, calling in neutrophils, leaking the blood vessels, all that stuff. As if there are pathogens present, whether they are or not. You'll still get the heat, redness, swelling, and pain, the release of the chemical mediators, the histamine, the prostaglandins, the kinins, just because you've damaged the tissue. You don't have to have pathogens present. Sometimes inflammation is caused only by the presence of pathogens. Think of this. Let's say there's no injection in my arm here. Nobody hit me with a stick. 
But let's say I had some sort of little bacterial infection. Maybe bacteria got in through a little micro cut here. So I'd still have a little tissue damage, but as the bacteria multiply, now they start putting pressure on my tissue, damaging my tissue, and bang, inflammation happens right there. So the key thing for inflammation being triggered would be damage to a tissue. There are two other chemicals important for a person to think about when they talk about inflammation that are also involved. The first one, PDGF, platelet-derived growth factor. This is a chemical that can stimulate fibroblast cells, which means increase your tissue repair. The thing that is sort of irritating about the name, yes, platelets can release it, but other cells release this too. I'm going to say that again. Just because it has platelet in the name doesn't mean platelets are the only cells that release this. About a half century ago, when it was first identified, people saw it coming out of platelets. So that's where the name comes from. So in my injury, my wound, damaged tissue cells can also release platelet-derived growth factor, which will stimulate neighboring tissues to help me repair after the damage. So you often see that one described in inflammation. And the last one, CRP, which is a very interesting protein in immunity, C-reactive protein is its name. And the C comes from complement, specifically complement protein number one, that you will or have heard about in your lecture already, I assume. If you haven't heard about it yet, pay attention in your lectures. You'll probably hear about the complement cascade. What does this have to do with inflammation? Well, this one, CRP, this is a protein released by the liver in response to inflammatory chemicals. A protein released by your liver in response to inflammatory chemicals. And this chemical will actually bind to the first complement protein. That's where its name comes from. But that's not why it's significant to many people in the health professions. So don't get dizzy. Got to go back up to my picture here. So when histamine is released and the prostaglandins are released and I've all of a sudden got all these leaky blood vessels. So I've got all these chemicals involved with inflammation, histamine, the kinins, the prostaglandins. And they're not going to live in isolation right here at this wound because I just made my blood vessels in this whole area leaky. So they're going to leak in too, aren't they, these chemicals? So histamine leaks into my bloodstream. The prostaglandins leak into my bloodstream. The kinins leak into my bloodstream. And when some of those chemicals get to my liver, the liver's response to that is to spit out CRP. Now, the liver, in my example, is not the thing that was inflamed, is it? I got inflamed by being hit with a stick. But CRP is still dumped into my bloodstream when I have inflammation. And thanks to our friends in the chemistry world, we can test for this protein pretty easily in somebody's blood. So high CRP levels in somebody's blood is a big indicator of inflammation.
Now here's my question for you. And I want you to think about this and I want you to think about it logically. Why would I need to test someone's blood for CRP to see if they have inflammation? Couldn't I just look at them? Well, sure, if the inflammation was visible. I can see a swollen ankle. I can see a knot on your head. I can see a gash in your arm. Can I see inflammation of your lung, your stomach lining, inflammation of your esophagus, your heart, etc.? So do you see how this could be useful sometimes? So CRP does not, I'm going to repeat this, not tell you where inflammation is. It only tells you that there is inflammation somewhere. So a person might be suspicious that I have endocarditis, inflammation of the heart. So they test for CRP and say, aha, maybe I'm right. And then further testing is required. So a blood test for elevated CRP tells me inflammation is, but it does not tell me where it is. I hope that's clear to everybody. I think I have droned on probably long enough about inflammation. As you can tell, it is quite an interesting topic. So remember, inflammation, a nonspecific immunity process, may or may not involve pathogens, but it will involve tissue damage, the release of chemical mediators, and the four cardinal signs. So hopefully this little lecture is helpful Maybe it's too long. I don't know. But guess what? You can always fast forward me, fast forward me, A and P nerds. So please feel free to do that if there's a bunch of this stuff you already know. For now, I'll just stop talking and see you find people in the next little lecture.